A few days ago, I put out a video uh, where I answered a question asked of a friend um, about Isaiah 14, 12 in the King James compared to the NIV and really compared to modern English translations. Um, the question was, is there a contradiction between those two versions and does the NIV and modern English translations or much many modern English translations confuse uh, Satan and Jesus in Isaiah 14, 12? There is an old saying that says, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, that has not been a pleasant experience on my end as a result of doing that video. But nevertheless, um, uh, I'm, I'm dumb enough to do it. Uh, I'm dumb enough to do it, and I guess I'm willing to take that bullet uh, if it means that we address truth. Uh, I have everything Bill Grady ever wrote. I have listen to lecture after lecture after lecture from uh, many a person who is King James only. I have never preached out of anything but that. Uh, that being said, when it comes to answering questions, I am going to look it up and I'm going to see if it's in there. Uh, I have read front to back Gail Ripplinger's New Age versions. Uh, I know it like the back of my hand. Uh, I have had three versions of it. I've lost two somehow. I don't know if I donated them, gave them to somebody and told them to read them and said, here, this will help you. Um, but I have another version that I've bought to replace those two. Um, yeah, so I've given that out to people and said, here, go take this. This is what you need. Um, I've got many, many books. I've got books on my shelf back here and I've got a stack at home uh, that I took off of my shelf and took home for uh, for research purposes, and, and here's what I found. Uh, I've told my people, do not take my word for anything. You look it up and make sure that it's in there. And I've taught some of the things that are in those books, uh, but I made a mistake. I, I went and started looking it up to see if it was in there. I, I started verifying what was in those books, and I, I can tell you that uh, I have certainly, over the last while, not liked what I've seen but it has caused me to dig deeper. It has caused me to research more. And I can tell you from doing my devotions and my personal reading in Greek and in Hebrew, um, it, it is, and in some cases Latin, it, it, is, it has been incredible and it has been eye-opening and it has been shocking. Uh, and as a result of my video the other day, I had another friend, uh, I, I dare not out this person, uh, asked me to consider doing another video like the one I did on Isaiah 14, 12 with regards to Daniel 3, 25. Um, so again, I'm, I'm dumb enough to do it. And why would I do that? Because I think it's necessary. As, as much as I don't like it, uh, as much as it, it, it offends me uh, to, you know, to, to see these things really in the text that, that I are contradictory to what I have been trained to hear, or what I've been trained to know, uh, what I've been trained to teach others. And all I can do is uh, present the evidence as it exists. And we have an option then. Do we accept the evidence as it exists, or do we look at it and continue to go, no, I don't, I don't care what it says, I'm going to believe this. And when we do that, we have, it's okay, when we draw a line in the sand like that and said, in spite of all evidence, I'm going to believe this, it, that is no longer a faith claim because our faith is not a blind faith. It is a, a faith based on substance. And no matter what it is, when we knowingly have evidence in front of us and we still willingly say, no, I'm going to believe this in spite of all evidence, that is wrong and it's dangerous. And uh, we need to be careful with that. And so I will tell you, my presuppositions over the last while have been flipped on end. I'm definitely seeing things from a different perspective, uh, but I believe I'm seeing them from a truthful perspective. And so I am going to dig in now and look at Daniel 3.25 and I'm going to present it as the evidence exists. We're going to look at various Bible versions. We're going to compare them. We're also going to look and see the, the person who caused this issue, this concern that we're now going to discuss today, 
Uh, we can trace it back to one man, and we can see where this controversy was implemented. We can see exactly why he did what he did, because he told us. And so we're going to look and see what his own words said about this situation. So let's dig in and let's look at Daniel 3 and verse 25. Grab your King James Bible and let's go to work. So here we are in, uh, in Lagos and we are going to look at several different versions today. In the middle of the screen there is um, my faithful King James uh, version. And um, actually in Daniel 2, we're going to come back to that here in just a minute. Uh, Daniel 3 and let's, let's flip down to Daniel 3.25. There we go. Here's the verse in question. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Our King James Bible says the Son of God. If you look to the right, you'll see the NIV here. And it says, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. So in the King James, you have the son of God. In the NIV, it, is, uh, it reads different, and it says like a son of the gods. Now, I want to illustrate that this is not just an issue between the King James and the NIV. This is an issue between the King James and modern English translations. But just to prove that, here's the ESV like a son of the gods, the Christian Standard Bible. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Here's the brand new Legacy Standard Bible. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Here's the NASB 2020. Should have pulled up the 95, but nevertheless you can see. Uh, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. So it's a consistent problem between uh, the King James Version and modern English versions. Actually, let's, let's do this. I, I'm curious what the New King James says. Let's see what it says. Uh, in Daniel 3 and verse 25, uh, it actually says, uh, it sticks with the King James and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So uh, we could stick with And actually, I, I think that there is a common thread here. Let me just prove this out. Let me go back and grab... Uh, let me see. Let me grab... Let's grab Tyndale. No, not Tyndale. Let's grab Wycliffe. Uh, let's grab Wycliffe's translation. And yep, there it is. Let me make this big where you can see it. And it says, this is the oldest English translation. This is from around, uh, this is sometime in uh, the 1300s when this was written. It's Middle English, so it's a little hard to read, but there it says, to the Son of God. So uh, even go every English translation, um, and I said every, but let me go back and just show you one more example. Let's go to the Geneva because I want you to see it for yourself. I'll zoom in here, make the text bigger. There it is. <clears throat> and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. The King James, the New King James, the Geneva Bible, uh, and the, even the Wycliffe, all of these say Son of God. And the modern English translations say Sons of God. So what says the, what says the original text, or the original languages, we should say? Since someone will certainly tell me we don't have the originals, but we do have uh, the original languages. And we have manuscripts, reliable manuscripts, uh, going back to as early as the second century, maybe even the first, depending on uh, the dating. But we'll focus on this issue here at hand. Going back to just the NIV and the King James, there it is, the Son of the Gods or the Son of God. Uh, if we go to, let's actually, let's trace it back this way. Let me find the Vulgate here. Right here you can see this same section and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. In the Latin Vulgate, written around 382 AD, it says, Ines es et species corti similis filio dei. In this last part, filio dei, is son of God. Son of God. So the fourth is similar to the son of God. We see that the Vulgate is consistent with the King James and with the older 
uh, English versions that we've already looked at. So the King James, New King James, the Geneva, the Wycliffe, those all are consistent with the Vulgate. But let's go back and let's see what it was prior to the Vulgate and what would those be? Well, uh, the best way, places to look would be the Septuagint. And so the Septuagint in that verse says, Angelou Theou. So that says an angel, Angelou, angel of God. We have Son of God in the Vulgate, we've got Sons of God, we've got Son of God, and now all of a sudden in the Greek Old Testament that was written around 150 BC, we have something even different, an angel of God. Again, there's no definite article. It is an angel of God. Is Nebuchadnezzar seeing an angel? Is he seeing the Son of God? Is he seeing a son of the gods? Uh, well, let's go back to the Hebrew. Because that's, and, and, and yeah, let's go back to the Hebrew and let's talk about this for a moment. Daniel, uh, let me let you look at me for a minute so I can look at you while I'm talking with you. Um, we generally say the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. That's not entirely so. There are a few portions of the Old Testament that are written in Aramaic. Aramaic uses the same alphabet as Hebrew. They are very similar languages. This is where we see it is in Aramaic that we have the development of the uh, block letters that we look at that we're reading on the screen here. Um, this Daniel chapter 3 is one of those chapters that is written not in, Ara not in Hebrew but in Aramaic. And we need to understand that. That is very, very important. Why is that important? Well, let's look at Daniel chapter 3 here as we go back to our screen. And we look here, and I'll flip back over to the King James for a moment so you can see it, uh, the King James, the NIV, and then here is the Hebrew, or rather the Aramaic. And the, the phrase in question is right here at the bottom. So we have Labar Elahin. Labar, so we have a son, or a son of, and then Elahin, this is not Elohim. This is not Elohim. This is not the same word that is used in Genesis 1, uh, talking about creation. This is not a word that is used for uh, God Almighty, for the God of the Old Testament, the God of the Scriptures, the God of the Bible. That This is not the same name. This is Elohim. And in Aramaic, we need to understand what that word is. So we're not going to look to the Hebrew to see what Elohim is. Uh, we're going to look and see what Elohim is in the Aramaic. And so Elah, is, if we had the singular form of that, it would be a god. It's a non, it would be a, a masculine, singular. But when we add the in to that, when it becomes Elohim, it is plural. That is an important distinction. So let me just give you this. In, in our Old Testament, and in, in Hebrew, Elohim can mean either singular or plural. Now, it, it can, it's, there's places where it's used to refer to many gods. And of course, in Genesis uh, 1, in the creation story, uh, it is referring to one god, um, the, the plurality is an emphasis on the, uh, the majesty, the might, the importance. But Aramaic is different. Aramaic, uh, anywhere you see Elohim, it always is plural. Now, let's go back and let's look at that some more uh, because I want to show you that the King James translators didn't come up with this on their own. Obviously, the Geneva Bible has the same thing, the Wycliffe Bible. So even, you know, this is not a Textus Receptus thing. The TR is, is, is New Testament. So this is an Old Testament thing. Remember, the Septuagint says angel of God. The Hebrew or the Aramaic says the son of gods, not the son of God. It says uh, a son of gods. Uh, so we see that it is plural. What do we do? What we do is we go and look and see where other places, where Elohim is used in the scriptures and how it's translated. So if we go to Daniel 4, just scroll down to Daniel 4, and let's look at Daniel 4, 8. 
And we'll look at this also, actually, oops, Daniel 4.8. Let's look at it in the King James. Let's look at it in, look at it in the NIV. And it tells us, But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, that's Elah, that's singular, and it says, and, and in whom the spirit of the holy, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, plural. Why is that plural? Well, if we move over here, again, we're looking at the same thing in Aramaic, and we have uh, right here, Elohim, Kadashin. Elohim is gods, plural, masculine plural, and we have Kadashin, which is holy. Look how it's translated in the King James. Not holy God, but holy gods. I've shown you that it's the exact same word in the Aramaic, in which it was written in both Daniel 3.25 and Daniel 4.8. But here it's translated gods, and in Daniel 3.25 it's translated God in the King James. Let's go to Daniel 2. So if we go all the way up to Daniel 2, uh, it's a long way. Bear with me. Look at this. Look at Daniel 2, verse number 11. Over here in the Aramaic, we have the word Elohim once more. You can see here in the middle of the screen in the King James, and it's a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods, plural. And the King James translators looked at this and said, Elohim is plural. So they translated it plural here. The Vulgate does the same, and looking over at the NIV, what do we see? No one can reveal it to the king except the gods. So I have to ask this question, why? Why did Jerome and subsequent translators, Wycliffe, the King James translators, the Geneva translators, and so on, the new, even the New King James kept it? Why did they keep Daniel 2 and Daniel 4 Ela, interpreting or translating Elohim as gods, but in this portion, Daniel 3.25, they made it the son of God? Well... The truth is, is there is an answer. There is a reason. And we know, so we've, I've already shown you that that traces back to Jerome. And we can see that's when it shows up uh, in the Vulgate. Prior to that, it's Elohim, it's gods. And, and, and the Greek does its own thing. Uh, and, and there is some interpretation there uh, in the text. And they create uh, the angels uh, of God. Uh, so what do we do then? Well, what we do is we look and see what Jerome said about it. So let's go straight to the guy who did this, and let's see what he said. So he said this in his, and just for the record, this is St. Jerome's commentary on Daniel. Now, this, is, this one in particular was published in 1958, translated by Gleason Archer. But he said, and the appearance of the fourth man is the likeness of a son of God. So he doesn't even say it's the son of God. He says it's a son of God. Oh, and you can't see my screen. Now you can see my screen. So these are Jerome's, this is Jerome's commentary on Daniel, the man who gave us the Latin Vulgate, which so much of the King James uh, and our older English translations are based on in many ways or agree with in many areas. And he says this, As for the appearance of the fourth man, which he asserts to be like that of a son of God, either we must take him to be an angel, as the Septuagint rendered it, or indeed as the majority think, the Lord our Savior. Yet I do not know how an ungodly king could have merited a vision of the Son of God. Notice this, of the Son of God. I don't know how an ungodly king could have merited a vision of the, the Son of God. On that reasoning, one should follow Symmachus. Symmachus was a translator uh, around the uh, around the second century, and he interpreted it this way. But the appearance of the fourth is like unto the sons, not unto the sons of God, but unto gods themselves. We're to think of angels here. That's why the Septuagint has that. Who, after all, are very frequently called gods as well as sons of God. So much for the story itself. But as for its typical significance, this angel or son of God foreshadows our Lord Jesus. So, right there, Jerome says it himself. 
that the literal interpretation is a son of the gods uh, or an angel of God, but because of the foreshadowing, because of its typical significance, because of the typology, he translated it, the son, or he translated it, the son of God, uh, so that everyone who was reading it would see that symbolism. But he said it himself. I do not know how an ungodly king could have merited a vision of the Son of God. And that's what we need to ask ourselves. What did Nebuchadnezzar say? What did Nebuchadnezzar say? Did Nebuchadnezzar look down into the fire and see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire walking, see a fourth one, and see Jesus? Now, I believe that he probably did see. I believe he did see Jesus. Not probably. I believe he did. But did he know that he was seeing the second person of the Godhead, and that is not an insult, that is not a, a bad thing, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Uh, when he looked into that fire, when he looked in that pit, and he saw four men, and the fourth was, what did he see? Does, what does this pagan, idolater, and polytheist who worships many gods know of the the triune God of the Bible when the triunity of God is even concealed in our Old Testament. Now, it's revealed in the New, and now that we have the New, we can look back and see it all throughout the Old Testament. And yes, I've got a book right over here on my shelf that says the triunity of God is Jewish. But are we really going to expect that Nebuchadnezzar looked in there and with his understanding of of Jewish theology that he is going to look and say this is the son of God that this is the Messiah this is Jesus is that what he was saying no it's not what he was saying he said he sees the son of the gods that's what the text says that he says that's what the Aramaic that that, that, that we have in our original language says that Nebuchadnezzar said we've got to ask ourselves this question is the NIV did the NIV get it wrong here no no, it didn't. Uh, I, and I'm not a fan of the NIV, but it didn't get it wrong. Uh, there's a lot of places, you know, the NIV is, is a dynamic equivalent translation. And so it's not a word for word. It's more thought for thought. Uh, and there are some, some, some things there that, that are really, I, I really don't like. But just like was Isaiah 14, 12, this is not something that they got wrong. This is something that they got right. Now, does our, okay, now am I attacking my King James Bible? Am I attacking the, the King James and the authority and the purity of the King James? No, but now you know why it's translated the Son of God. It's translated the Son of God by the King James translators because they wanted that symbolism there that Jerome added. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's different. It, it's, it's different. It's not what Nebuchadnezzar said. Uh, it is a fourth century interpretation of the text that made it into uh, the Latin Vulgate that ended up in the earliest Middle English version with Wycliffe. And it in, then in the 1500s, it made it into the Geneva Bible. It made it into the King James Bible. And then in the late 20th century, when the new King James was created, they kept it. This is not a problem with the modern translations. It is consistent with the text. Now, this is not a problem with the Alexandrian or the um, versus the Byzantine or the Antiochian versus the Alexandrian traditions or manuscripts. It's not the case. We're talking about the Old Testament. This is Old Testament. So I went back to the Masoretic uh, and, and showed you there, showed you the Septuagint. And I know that many people do not like the Septuagint. I showed you that it says something different, angels of God. But here, this absolutely says um, sons of gods. Um, that or son of gods. That's what he. That's what Nebuchadnezzar said he saw in, in Aramaic. Elohim is always plural. I showed you where it is translated as plural in Daniel two and Daniel four. And we have to ask ourselves if it's plural there. Why is it not plural in Daniel three twenty five? The only conclusion is is Jerome translated it according to his own testimony. Translated it. Son of God, because he wanted to portray the symbolism, the imagery, the foreshadowing of our Lord Jesus. 
Um, and that's what he did. So all we can do is take it for what it's worth and I'll present the truth to you. And if you find something otherwise, let me know. Else we have some thinking to do. Thank you.